Hey y'all, welcome back to my channel. My name is DeAndre Levon, if you are new here. And if you are not new here, then welcome back to The Click. So this video is going to be the first of many. I'm starting a brand new series that's going to be about topics that may or may not show up on your NCE exam. And I'm going to kind of try to explain these topics in a way that is a little bit easier to understand compared to just reading through the DSM. So feel free to pause this video, rewind, take notes, make flashcards, whatever you need to do, because we are all getting passing scores on our first try on this NCE exam. And make sure that you check out my video on how I studied for my NCE exam and how I passed it on my first try. For this video, we're going to be starting off with personality disorders. So the DSM defines personality disorder as an enduring pattern of inner experience and behavior that deviates markedly from the expectations of the individual's culture, is pervasive and inflexible, has an onset in adolescence or early adulthood, is stable over time, and leads to distress or impairment. So there are actually 10 different personality disorders and it can be a little daunting at first, but don't fear because they have divided the 10 different personality disorders into three clusters. So there's cluster A, B, and C. So in each cluster, they have grouped together the different personality disorders that kind of sort of go together. So for instance, cluster A is the odd or eccentric cluster, and it includes paranoid personality disorder, schizoid personality disorder, as well as schizotypal personality disorder. Cluster B is the dramatic and unpredictable cluster. It includes the antisocial personality disorder, borderline personality disorder, histrionic personality disorder, as well as the narcissistic personality disorder. And lastly, we have cluster C. So this is the anxious and fearful cluster. It includes the avoidant personality disorder, dependent personality disorder, as well as the obsessive compulsive personality disorder. So I felt like trying to cover all 10 of the personality disorders would have been a little bit overwhelming and it probably would have made this video super long. <laughs> so I decided to break them apart based on the three clusters. So this first video is going to be just on cluster A, which is the odd or eccentric cluster. So this is when you need to go get your pen and paper or use your phone, whatever you wanna to do to take notes. Now is the time to start. So paranoid personality disorder is the first one that we are going to cover. So the DSM defines this disorder as a pervasive distrust and suspiciousness of others such that their motives are interpreted as malevolent. So in order to receive this diagnosis, you have to have four of the following. So number one, people with paranoid personality disorders are always suspecting that people are out to get them or trying to hurt them. So it could be those people that you talk to and they're just like, oh yeah, people are always plotting against me. Everybody is out to get me. And that's not even really the case. Number two, they always think that their friends, family, or associates aren't actually trustworthy or loyal. So it doesn't matter how long you've known them or if you literally are related to them, they're still gonna say things like, nobody is loyal or I can't trust anybody. And it's because they have paranoid personality disorder. Number three. These people are very reluctant to share information with others because they always feel like the other person is going to use that information against them. So they typically just won't share anything. Or if you ask them questions, they get very suspicious. Like, why are you asking me that? Are you trying to use this? Paranoid. Number four, they're always trying to find hidden meanings in things. So they really read a lot into even like simple mistakes. So they could be at the store and the cashier gives them the wrong amount of change. And they're like, see, I knew they were all plotting against me. And you're like, no, it was just a mistake. <laughs> or you could just make a little small joke with them and they'll take it 
way too seriously and now you're out to get them as well. So number five, they hold grudges for long periods of time and they almost never forgive. So it could be something like you stole their ball back in second grade and they're never gonna let that go. <laughs> for the rest of your life, they are going to hold on to that grudge. So number six, people with paranoid personality disorder always feel like someone is trying to slight them. So that leads to them always being on the lookout and very defensive. So they're always quick to lash out and counterattack, even if they weren't being attacked in the first place. Number seven, these people are constantly suspicious that their romantic partner is cheating on them without any real evidence or justification. And the DSM calls this pathologically jealous. And I just really, really love that term because it's very fitting. But yeah, these people, they'll find a little small something in your phone, for instance, and they'll be like, see, I knew you were cheating on me. Meanwhile, you were just texting your brother or something like, <laughs> they're just very, very paranoid. And if any of you have been in relationships with people like this, then you know what I'm talking about. And lastly, number eight. So personality disorders cannot be diagnosed if the paranoid behaviors only happen within the context of another psychotic disorder, such as schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. So if you have another psychotic disorder, that's going to trump the paranoid personality disorder. Okay, so that was paranoid personality disorder. Next, we're going to move into the second disorder in cluster A, which is schizoid personality disorder. So the DSM defines this disorder as a pervasive pattern of detachment from social relationships and a restricted range of expression of emotions in interpersonal settings, beginning by early adulthood and present in a variety of contexts. So to get this diagnosis, you have to have four of the following. Number one, these individuals don't want to be close to anyone. That includes family, friends, anybody. They just don't want to be a part of any type of family group, social group, nothing. So this might be that cousin that you have that you never see. You almost forget they're even a part of the family <laughs> and they don't even care to be a part of the family. They might have schizoid personality disorder. Number two, they prefer to spend time by themselves. So these are the people that society typically names the loners of society. They're always gonna be by themselves. If they have a choice, they're going to pick a solitary activity versus one that involves interacting with other people. Number three, they prefer mechanical or abstract tasks. So they will typically spend a lot of time playing computer games, video games, or they might like things like mathematical games. And the DSM also says that these individuals usually have very little interest in sexual activities. So number four, these individuals enjoy very few things and they don't enjoy things that other people typically would enjoy. So something like walking on the beach or watching a sunset, going to the movies, these activities are not interesting to a schizoid personality disorder individual. They just don't get the same satisfaction from doing things as other people do. Number five, they have no close friends except possibly a first degree relative. And that's typically going to be like their mom or dad, maybe a sibling but that's it. They're not gonna be close to anyone else and they're not really gonna have any worry or care about not being close to anyone else. So number six, these individuals do not care what other people think about them. That includes praises and criticisms. <laughs> so you could say, hey, I love your shirt or I love your hair. They're not gonna care. And they also don't care if you say, I hate your shirt. Like it's just not gonna matter to them. Number seven, these individuals can appear cold because they don't reciprocate the normal social cues. So for instance, if you're talking to one of these individuals, they're not gonna give you the normal smiles and head nods or the little chuckles if you make a little joke. 
they're just kind of going to look at you with a straight face <laughs> which can be a little bit awkward and uncomfortable but it's just because they don't pick up on those normal social cues number eight just like with paranoid personality disorders schizoid personality disorder cannot be diagnosed within the context of a psychotic disorder all right so we've done paranoid personality disorder We've done schizoid personality disorder, and now we are on our last disorder of cluster A, which is schizotypal personality disorder. So the DSM defines this disorder as a pervasive pattern of social and interpersonal deficits marked by acute discomfort with and reduced capacity for close relationships as well as by cognitive or perceptual distortions and eccentricities of behavior beginning by early adulthood and present in a variety of contexts. So for this one, you have to have five of the following. So number one, ideas of reference. So ideas of reference refers to false beliefs that random occurrences somehow directly relate to themselves. For example, you could be walking in a crowd of people that you don't know at all and a schizotypal person might be like, all these people are all talking about me or all these people are laughing at me even though nobody knows who they are. Or they might be watching TV with you and they might say, everybody on the TV is talking directly to me. And of course, we know that's a false belief. So number two, these individuals are very superstitious and a lot of times they talk a lot about paranormal activity. So the people that are constantly talking about superstitions and ghosts and all those type of things, that is what this is talking about. So number three, these individuals a lot of times think that they have some type of special magical powers. So they may think that they can sense when something is going to happen before it happens, or they might think that they could read other people's minds, or they might think that they have magical control over other people. They may say things like, well, if I walk around this pole three times, then this is going to happen to this person. That would all be included in number three. So number four, these individuals often speak in a very vague way with loose associations. So this one is kind of hard to explain, but I feel like when you talk to a person that kind of has this, you know exactly what it is. They may say things like, the truth will be revealed. And then you say, okay, what truth or what are you referring to? And they'll be like, oh, I can't tell you that. They never fully explain what it is that they're talking about. It's just very, very vague. So number five, these individuals are often very suspicious and paranoid. So that one is pretty self-explanatory. We've already talked about paranoia. Number six, these individuals often are not really able to express the full range of emotions. So their interactions can seem very stiff or constricted. So with these people, they're not quite like the schizoid people where they just give you like a blank face, but they don't quite know how to show the different emotions. So it kind of just looks uncomfortable. Like they might try to smile or they smile in inappropriate times. And it's just because they don't quite know how to express all of those emotions appropriately. Number seven, these are the people that are likely to be called odd or eccentric. And it could be like their mannerisms or behaviors or the way they dress. It could just look like it doesn't quite fit. <laughs> Whatever the reason, they just don't quite blend in with others. Number eight. So like the schizoid individuals, individuals that are schizotypal also don't really have close relationships with others apart from maybe a first degree relative. But the difference is that with schizoid individuals, they just don't care. They have no interest in making friends or being close with others. Schizotypal individuals do oftentimes feel a little bit unhappy about not having close friends, but they kind of tend to shy away from it because they know that they don't quite fit in. So that is kind of the difference between the two. So number nine, 
These individuals are anxious in social situations, especially if they don't know anybody that's there. Gisotypal individuals will interact with others but they are not very comfortable doing so. They kind of just prefer to be by themselves, again, because they kind of recognize that they don't quite fit in with others. And when they are in these social situations, they have really high social anxiety that doesn't get better no matter how long they are in the situation. So for example, for most people, if you're going to somewhere that you don't really know anybody or you're not familiar, you might have a little bit of social anxiety in the beginning, but as the night goes on, you begin to feel better. That's not the case with a schizotypal individual. If they go to a party, they're gonna be super anxious when they first get there. And as the night goes on, they're probably gonna get more and more anxious. And again, this diagnosis should not be given within the context of a psychotic disorder. All right, y'all, so that was all three, paranoid, schizoid, and schizotypal personality disorders. I feel like paranoid is probably the simplest one of the three because it just kind of like makes sense. <laughs> They're paranoid. The two that I think are easily confused is the schizoid versus the schizotypal. And the easiest way that I can try to help you guys to keep those two apart is that schizoid people are loners, they don't wanna be around anybody, and they don't care about being around anybody. It just doesn't phase them at all what people think about them. They're just loners. Versus the schizotypal people, they don't quite fit in and they do have a hard time with social situations, but they actually kinda do care that other people don't talk to them or that they don't really have close friends but they just have a hard time fitting in. It could be just the way they act, their mannerisms. They're just kind of eccentric. And by default, it makes it hard for them to be close to others. So I hope that kind of helped <laughs> to separate those two. I'm going to make another video about cluster B and then another video about cluster C. So if you guys found this video helpful, please give me some feedback. Let me know in the comments, give this video a thumbs up. I'm hoping that these videos will really help you guys while you are trying to study for your NCE exam. And of course, if you are not already done so, make sure that you join the click by hitting that subscribe button. And also look down below in my description box, I included my ebook about how I became a licensed counselor, as well as my study template for how I studied for my NCE exam. And I use the Rosenthal Purple Book for my studying. So that is it for this video. Thank you guys so much for watching and thank you for following along with my journey. I hope to see you guys in my next video. Bye.